Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this sold-out event with Anne Lamott. I'm Susan Call, the events advisor at Politics and Prose, and on behalf of our owners and our staff, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this beautiful space. It's a thrill to introduce Anne and to welcome her back to Politics and Prose. We've hosted her many times, but the one I remember best was for her book, Some Assembly Required, which we held across the street in the store, and it was so packed we practically had people shoved in the bookshelves, so it's nice to be here in this more spacious church. Like many of you in this room, I've found Anne Lamott to be inspirational in about a dozen different ways. Her classic Bird by Bird has kept me going through many a crummy first draft, and it's not only full of wisdom, but it's unexpectedly funny. Her honesty, vulnerability, and humor have gotten me through many a bad day as well. Her new book, her 20th, does not disappoint. It's full of reflections on love, on falling in love, in finding beauty and love in the quotidian, in a cup of tea, in a spray of wildflowers, in a snoring dog. Writing in the Washington Post last week, Meredith Moran observed, no matter a Lamont book's title, no matter the theme of the yarns that burst from its pages like clowns from a circus car, its message is the same irresistible combo of love, hope, faith, and laughter. Anne will be in conversation tonight with the wonderful, funny, always incisive writer and reviewer, Marion Winnick. In addition to teaching at the University of Baltimore, Marion's the author of The Big Book of the Dead, First Comes Love, Above Us Only Sky, and other books. Her columns appear monthly at the baltimorefishbowl.com, and her essays have been published in publications including the New York Times Magazine and The Sun. She writes book reviews for Oprah and People and The Washington Post and hosts the NPR podcast The Weekly Reader and was a commentator on All Things Considered for 15 years. Uh, when I first thought that Marion might make a good moderator for this conversation, I didn't even know that she and Anne know each other from very early in their careers. And in fact, Anne gave a book party for Marion for her very first book in her house in 1994. So a nice synergy. Uh, please help me welcome Anne Lamott and Marion Winnick. Hi. Hi, hi. This is so fun. This is actually the first time I've seen Anne since the book party in 1994. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a big country. Um, and I'd like everyone to notice that I'm dressed in somehow blue. So when you get your book, you'll all be able to dress to match your book. It's a beautiful color blue and a beautiful book. And I'm so happy to be here to talk with Anne about it. And I asked her to start by reading to us a little bit. So let me give her... Speak into the mic. Mic. Okay. Okay, can you hear in the back? Okay. Okay, good. No? Okay, I don't know what to do. I have no skills. I'm, I can't do anything. Daniel, can you fix my mic? Um, what should I do? Can you, what, can you hear me? Oh, good. Oh, okay, I'm just going to read. This is not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is the first page and a half of the new book. It's called The Overture. My husband said something a few years ago that I often quote. Eighty percent of everything that is true and beautiful can be experienced on any ten-minute walk. Even in the darkest and most devastating times, love is nearby if you know what to look for. It does not always appear at first to be lovely, but instead may take the form of a hot mess or an old snoring dog or someone you have sworn to never ever forgive for a possibly very good reason if you ask me. But mixed in will also be familiar signs of love. Wings, good-hearted people, cats, when they're in the right mood, a spray of wildflowers, a cup of tea. 
What are we even talking about when we talk about love? What is it? I asked a six-year-old friend of mine. Oh, it's just this stuff, he said, rolling his eyes. I think that's right. Love is caring, affection, and friendliness, of course, compassion, and a generous heart. It is also some kind of energy or vibration, because everything is, the same stuff moving at different speeds from glaciers to six-year-old boys. I wish the movement of love in our lives more closely resembled the grace of a ballerina, but no, love mainly tromps and plops, falls over and falls over and tiptoes through our lives. Love looks like us, and that can be a little daunting. Love is why we are here at all, on the couch and in the world with a heart for the common good, why we have hope and a lifeline when we don't. There is sweet family love entangled by history, need, frustration, and annoyance. There is community love, a love of music, Zorba's reckless love of life. It can be vital or serene. Oh, I think that's enough. Well, I bet many people here first encountered Anne as I did through Bird by Bird. Let's hear it for Bird by Bird. And as the goddess of the writing process, which I know she is to so many of us with the shitty first drafts and the one-inch frames and the, re- the relatives on sta- radio station K-Fucked, um, <laughs> I wanted you to talk to us about what the writing process looks like for you now and um, how a book like this gets written? Oh, well, I don't think you're supposed to say K-fucked in a church, first of all. (laughs) I think there are standards. Oh, sorry. I'm Jewish, so I didn't know. (laughs) Um, I'm really sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, about a couple years ago, I just started feeling so much fear and pain about what the future was that my son and grandson were going to step into. And I, and, and I wanted to put things down in place, in one place, that was everything I know for sure to be true that has ever helped in any difficult situation or a crisis or a long patch of time, you know, like Bush Cheney. You know, or, 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 or in the aftermath of a breakup, or, or whenever. And there are certain things that have always worked and I believed surely would again. So I started writing about those for, to leave for them when I'm gone. I was gonna call the book P.S. And it was gonna be the kind of everything I had, everything I'd forgotten to mention, and, um, stories I had never told that I thought might be interesting for people and for Sam and Jax. But every story I wrote had to do with love, somehow or other. Community love, the love of music or of nature, family love, which can be dicey sometimes and is so sweet and pure other times, and and ecstatic love. And and all of a sudden I was writing a book about love. Now, I was mortified when I discovered this because (laughs) although I was born and raised and have lived almost every minute of my 70 years in California, it seemed too California even for me. <laughs> but um, but then I would give every story to my husband, Neil, and then he would love them, and so I wouldn't throw them away. And then, um, so I just started out with like one story at a time, you know, that's my policy, and and they take forever, These pe- they're, they're 3,000 words each at some time, you know, and they take a month to get them right. Everything takes, I write these pieces for um, the Washington Post for my editor, Mary Dunewald, and they're 1,100 words, and they take days and days to get right. So I think that's the good news if you're writing and you want to write and you can't figure out if you're writing right. If it's going slowly and badly, you're probably on to something. And you just, the way that I work, the way you work, I'm positive, the way Neil works is you just keep doing it over and over and you finally get it pretty close to what you had in mind all along. I agree with that. <laughs> um, the, since 
I don't know, many people here haven't had the chance to read the book yet, so I thought maybe you could tell us one of the stories. And of course, one of my favorites is the retainer story. Oh, the retainer story. Okay, well, there's a story in, right in the beginning called the Perp, uh, I know it's called Swag. And at my church, which is St. Andrew Presbyterian in Marin City, if you're looking for a church home, it's very progressive and relaxed. And 11 o'clock California time, I hope to see a lot of you there Sunday. Um, They give out these purple plastic bags that are filled with things that might come in handy if you lived out, if you're homeless and you live without a lot of access to water. It would be like body wash and um, dental floss. Now, I know that sounds ludicrous to give dental floss to the unhoused, but it's not my business to figure out what they're doing, right? Like, Jesus doesn't say to the blind man that he heals, what do you think you'll be looking at now, right? <laughs> so, so there were socks, two pairs of socks per bag, and a cap, a little beanie for each person, because it gets so cold. And, and, and we are um, asked to give them away and to get to spend some time with people that are unhoused, because Mostly people run from them or walk quickly by. And so I wrote a story. And, of course, it was frightening for a couple of them to see this nice old Christian lady come by with her purple bag, you know, and um, blinking and um, sitting down with them and starting to describe various shampoos. And um, But in this one case... I gave a bag to a woman and her child who was about 10, I think. I can't remember. You've read this book before, sooner, more recently than I have. But at any rate, they were Hispanic and she had a sign up. And, um, so I gave them a purple bag. They're pretty, you know, they're sizable. They have a lot of stuff in them. And, um, and then, um, I went on with my business. We blessed each other multiple times and I dropped off some cookies on my way out of the store and, um, and then I went home. Now, I was going to a memorial service in the city, and I have this tooth. When you get older, one of the delightful things that happens is that your teeth start moving around, right? And so a little bit. And so one of my teeth, I needed to get this kind of retainer that's called an Invisalign and um, so that I could, you know, get it back in place and keep it there. And I had taken it out to eat the food I got at Safeway, and I put it on the chair, the, the passenger seat. And then I picked up a girlfriend to go to the memorial service with me, and I couldn't find my retainer. And they're really expensive. They're $300. Or more. Or more. It breaks <laughs> your heart to give this money. I know, to because the... my daughter-in-law is an orthodontist. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, they're 300 or more. And I couldn't find it. My friend and I tore the car apart. We couldn't find it anywhere. And I just knew it had slipped down. We tried. I couldn't find it. So I went without, got home, got Neil. We tore the car apart, literally. And I couldn't find it. And so I did what you do. I prayed for help. I asked St. Anthony to look around. Something was lost that must be found, right? Because I have always been very honest about having the theological understanding of like a, a really bright second grader. So I, I said my little prayer, went to the memorial, so I couldn't find it, couldn't find it. Oh, no, and so then Neil and I were going, it's funny because we went to a memorial service at noon, and then Neil and I were going to the city because I was conducting, I was the officiant at a wedding. And I said, let's just swing by. That's the last place I remember seeing it. So I swing, and they're still there. The mom and her boy, he's been on the phone literally for six hours. He looks up, you know, he's bored with me. And, um, and I explain to them, this or this piece, this retainer, can I look through your bag? What? Can I look through your bag? And so they say, okay, and it's there. Right? God is such a show off that of course it's there. And so I laugh, and I've already given him 20 bucks, right? Um, when I gave them the purple bag of love. And so I said, oh, my God, thank you. This is so expensive. And the boy looked at me, and he went like this. <laughs> the universal sign of, you know, give me some money. And so I gave him another 20 because I'd saved about 260 at that point. <laughs> and uh, so that's the sort of story that you'll find in, um, you know, just you make mistakes, you screw up, we're all a little screwed up. We're all a little, we're all a little the way we are. You know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez had that great line that there's your public life, 
your personal life, and then there's your secret life, you know, and that's where things get skeevy, let's say. And, um, and anyway, we all have that, and we, but we all have the same stuff. And you think you alone are the biggest hypocrite or, or backstabber or fraud. That's the main thing. We're all just in the same boat. So, and you step on the cosmic banana peel and you go down hard sometimes. And well, what pulls you I up? don't want to give you PTSD, but speaking of cosmic banana peel, oh, I was cleaning my daughter's room that's off at grad school today, and I found this Taylor Swift Person of the Year magazine. And I remembered that, Annie, you had a little dust-up about Taylor Swift in your long history of making big comments on social media. And in in the current book, um, Annie talks about her long, never-ending story about saying something that wasn't the cool thing to say about Caitlyn Jenner, I think. But now... She said something that wasn't the cool thing to say about Taylor Swift. It wasn't even uncool. And I got canceled. Here's what happened. Before We're going to uncancel her tonight. That's why I want her no, to get no, this off her no, chest. No. I don't <laughs> mind being canceled because there's material there. But anyway, what happened was before Christmas, I read something. It was probably in People magazine. And it was giving me the information that Taylor Swift's boyfriend's it told me what the Kate, Taylor Swift's boyfriend's cousin had gotten Taylor Swift for Christmas. And I hit a bottom around it because the only news for months had been Taylor Swift, right? Every newspaper cover, every everything, the gigantic... And because so, she was person of the year. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> and so I wrote what I thought was sort of innocuous. I said, my hope for 2024 is that we can read a little bit less about Taylor Swift. That is all I said, right? And I got more attention than I've ever gotten in my life. In my life, I made it literally into every single major newspaper and magazine. I was in left-wing magazines, and I got a 100,000 hate tweets and hate everything. Well, you're just jealous because you're an old white lady who hasn't done as well as she has. And uh, you're just an old white lady who's fat. You know, I mean, and it you went. You call yourself a I know, feminist, and you're just, and it went on and on. I mean, I love on. Taylor Swift, but this was over the I'm top. I'm not positive I I've ever it. heard a Taylor Swift song. I'm sure she's wonderful. I love for all these women to do well, but it happened in the blink of an eye. And anything I picked up, and the phone started ringing. Are you okay? I'm so happy that we've gotten to reconnect after 30 years so I could share this Taylor Swift situation with you. Um, I was sort of amazed at the collision of the whole thing. But, you know, I think, Annie, you might have to be, stay off social media. <laughs> um, so what I want to know is, do you have, like, a group of close writing friends or a writing group that you show your writing to early? Mm-hmm. I do. I first show it to Neil, and he's a writer too. Some of you know of his last book, which is called Better Days, Taming Your Inner Critic, which we should talk about if we talk about writing, because we all have it. And um, he's a, and it's funny, because when we were first dating, see, I'd been on Match for a year, and men were bringing me manuscripts, <laughs> right? And a man that I liked a lot for the first and second date asked before our third date if it was too early to bring a plot treatment, right? And so I meet this handsome, obviously overeducated guy who's cute and just completely erudite, and, um, and he announces he's a writer too. And so I thought, oh, my heart sinks. And, um, and so right away we gave each other something we'd been working on. And he was a wonderful writer. I was so relieved. I just, I felt like I was flooded with endorphins. And um, I really was. I was so worried after my year on match. And then, um, so the first thing I do is give it to Neil. And he's very honest. And he, um, usually he'll come in and he'll say, sometimes he'll come and go, oh, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. And then I like him more, obviously. 
And, um, and then sometimes he comes in and he has a bit of a face on him and he worries, you know, he's kind of tugging at his chin like a rabbi and because he's trying to figure out how to say to me that it's not quite done yet. And then he marks it up really carefully and he says, I don't, I didn't quite get this and this I thought went on too long and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And I also give it to another friend named Doug, who's a really brilliant editor, who used to be the editor of Mother Jones. Did you ever meet Doug Foster back in the day? Yeah. No, but I read Mother Jones. Yeah, That's yeah. Such a great magazine. And so I do. I show it to a couple people. And I, I'm somebody who needs And then I send it to Mary Dunewald if it's a post piece. And then she, like, makes these microscopic changes. It's so great because Neil's already gone over it. But she doesn't know that, but now she does because she's here. <laughs> But um, that's the reason there's not much to do on him is because um, Neil's done it. Didn't you say that your son has some kind of like online... My son, Sam Lamott, who a lot of you think must be like 17 or 18 now, if you read operating instructions, is 34. <laughs> and he has a 15-year-old son, my grandchild, Jax. He's almost 15. Who this book is dedicated to. Who the book is dedicated to. And my son and his fiance and his best friend started this community. I know some of you afterwards were tell me that will tell me you're in it. It's called it's one word, it's a writing And it's five hundred people, five hundred and fifty people online forming communities to kind of breathe down each other's necks and say, finish it, finish it, or start it, start it. There's a lot of people that have been published and there's a lot of people I, that's mostly where I do my teaching now is I give talks there. I did a um, bird by bird um, book club and I did that over five weeks and stuff like that. And editors will come in and give talks to the other writers. So so he's doing that. And, um, yeah, I forgot what the question was. I just, it was just, I wanted to hear oh, yeah. about that yeah, writing yeah. support it's thing that your cool. son does. Yeah. And I'm the princess. It's so cool. I think I'm on the masthead as the princess. Oh. Yeah. So, um, I'm a huge fan of your novels. And, um, now we haven't had one since 2010. So I want to ask, and, um, the last one, uh, Imperfect Birds was, so great. Oh. And I really I'm hoping that you're going to tell me you'll write another novel someday. So I'm asking. I don't think I will. Oh. And I'll tell you why. Novels are really hard. And they, and so, how, how many people here are writing novels? A lot of you. A bunch of you. Neil. Yeah, yeah. Um, they take years to get them right. And you have to keep so many plates spinning in the air. And you can't just write what you can see through a one-inch picture frame. You kind of have to have a vision, you know. And, and I'm tired. And this is my 20th book. And I kind of, I'd love to step out of the literary world. All I'd like to do for the rest of my life is read mm. and read great books. And I told Neil eight years, almost eight years ago when we met, I said, I, I want you to know that, that all I really want to do is to read. And that was kind, it's kind of all I do anyway. But I just want to, I, I want to, I think I want to just sort of step back for a while. I won't miss well, it. This I is not love, good news, but we'll yeah. have to put up with it. Okay. I also only want to read, so I can yeah. sympathize. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I pretty much only do read with yeah. reviewing yeah. for Oprah, Kirkus, Newsday, People, Good Housekeeping, Washington Post, blah, blah, blah. So mm-hmm. yeah. So what have you read lately that you liked? Uh, well, I want to tell people about Marion's book, where we connected as a book called First Comes Love, from the famous children's uh, little lines that we said to each other. But I will stake my reputation on it, such as it is, that you will love this book, First Comes Love. And her last name is W-I-N-I-K. Um, you know what? I read really good stuff during the day, and I read The New Yorker, and I read nonfiction, and I read stuff that you concentrate on and that is rich mm. in spirit, and I don't at night. You know, I did when I was younger. I'd get in bed with, like, some avant-garde Japanese poetry, and now, I mean, I think after I had a baby that that was, those days ended. Yeah. And now I get in bed, and I try to find the most literary thriller I can find. Uh. We were talking about Jane Harper. If you don't know about Jane Jane Harper, the Australian writer, right? Yeah, One book, great. just start with dry. That's easy to remember. She's just a wonderful writer, and you get to be in the outback. And, um, of course, I love Kate Atkinson, and I love Barbara Kingsolver. She is so great that 
she inspires me to write, but she also makes me physically ill because she's so much better than I'm ever going to be. She, no, she really is. Different. No, different. not different. No, she's so... Yes. But did you read good. Demon Copperhead? Yes. Oh, it's it so just good. made me physically so ill. Good. Yeah. It just it made me want to give up. Yeah. But she's so good. I mean, everyone knows about Poisonwood Bible, right? right? Everyone here has read Poisonwood Bible. But you also want to read the Lacuna, which yeah. you will love equally, which is um, Diego Rivera and, um, oh, God, what's her name? The artist. Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo and Trotsky. Poor Trotsky tottering around Mexico City trying to not get assassinated. And it's just a weave of the 20s in Mexico City, which is just about my favorite city anyway, one of them. So um, that's what I've been reading. That's great. Um, yeah. I wonder, I'm going to totally switch topics here. Um, Annie was recently interviewed by um, this great writer named D. Watkins, who's, um, uh, yeah, he my, was my student at the University of Baltimore. And um, so I feel so close to him, and I was so excited to see that, you know, he's all grown up now and interviewing Annie Lamont and, <laughs> and having this great career. But um, he was so fascinated by your um, fearlessness about death and what you said about death, and he highlighted it beautifully in their interview in Salon. Um, I wonder if you'll talk about that. About death? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, I was wondering, like, do you, what do you picture? Well, I, uh, I wrote, there's a number of pieces about death in the new book. There's one um, that involves my father and then a very close friend who was younger than I am and a runner and suddenly had idiopathic lung disease. And, and I, I've been close to a lot of people who are dying. I've been with them when, while they died and I've been with them in the month before. And sometimes families ask me if I can step in because my dad died when I was very, when I was 25 and that was, a two-year process, um, and then my best friend died when I was in my I was thirty-seven, and right, then but isn't it, that's in Bird by Bird when your friend dies, isn't it? She gets sick and yeah, dies in operating yes. instructions. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I told a couple of Pammy stories in Bird by Bird. Right. Can I tell one Pammy story right yes, now? Yes, I want to okay. hear a Pammy story. Okay, here's a Pammy story. Here's the great death story. In fact. So I'd known Pammy my whole life, literally. We had our best friends were, were sisters, and then we ended up being close, close, close by, you know, 12. And um, so right before, about six weeks before she died, she was in a wheelchair and a wig, and we went shopping because I had this, the latest hostage was this man who um, loved his, his women, um, to wear, like he liked them, he wanted me to wear a dress. We were going to go see Lucinda Williams, and he liked, you know, and I usually dress like John Goodman. Like, it's not, it's really not my thing. And I got this lavender dress, and it was short, and it was a little tighter. I mean, anything is a little tighter than I usually wear. And I came out of the dressing room, and I said to Pammy, Do you think this makes me look big in the hips? And she looked at me with just all seriousness, and she said, Annie, you don't have that kind of time. <laughs> and my, t- my life was changed. And my life was changed. I got it. I just grokked it, that we're all on borrowed time, and you don't want to waste your time on a bunch of meaningless BS, right? Like what your thighs look like. So anyway... So I have been with a lot of people who have died. And in fact, when Neil and I met, he was a hospice volunteer. So we had this bond. And he was two or three times a week going off to be with people who would become his friends who were going to be dying pretty soon. And also, I'm a Christian. I'm a Sunday school teacher, right? So I believe that death is basically a rather significant change of address. So um, I just don't feel, I feel afraid of my son or my grandchild dying, you know. And I, I think that I wouldn't be able to survive that, but my very best friend, Janine's son died three years ago. And she came through because of love, because of the community love, the love of reco- in recovery, her, her sober sisters, her, her church, her family, her, all the different realms of love lifted her. And it was awful. And this side of the grave, she's going to feel so grief struck that she lost her child who was 23 and a perfect person, an adorable, beautiful young man. 
But at the same time, she resurrected. She got her life back. She had, a, you know, she has this battered up toolbox from having been sober for 35 years. And it said, you pick up the 200-pound phone when you're at the absolute end of your rope. And you say to somebody, I'm not okay. Can you come over? I'm not okay. Can we go to Target? I'm not okay. I, I can't get out of bed. And the other person says, oh, my God, I'm so glad you called, right? 100% of the time. And she did what you do. And she felt like awful, awful, awful. For, and yet she, we laughed a lot, you know. We cried a lot. We laughed a lot. We washed his body. I can tell you when someone dies, the women wash the body. That's how it has always been and how, and how it shall be forevermore. And if you're a very, very lucky man, that you will be invited to do the same. And it's a sacred ritual. And she's on any given day in, in, as happy as anyone I know with a broken heart. You know, and Carrie Fisher, St. Carrie, said the greatest thing. She said, um, when she'd been sober during one patch, an interviewer said to her, well, Carrie, are you happy now? Are you, you know, you're sober and you've got this show. And, and she said, like, are you crazy? She said, happy is one of the things I am every day, right? And it's like the culture and the commercials and the ads are, are all like, be happy, be happier, be happier. If you, if you get this, if you can lease it or date it or achieve it or marry it or rent it or whiten it, you're going to be so much happier. And it's just a crock. It's a great palace lie that there's anything out there that's going to fill those God-shaped holes. It's not out there. It's an inside job. And so, um, you know, I just, I just watched her cry, but, and the culture says, you gotta stop crying at some point. Come on. It's really painful, um, for the rest of us. And what we say in recovery is you should cry for as long as you feel like crying. And the crying, and we won't pick up a drink no matter what, but the crying will bathe you and moisturize you and baptize you, and it will water the ground at your feet. And who knows what birds have flown over bo- overhead when you weren't looking and dropped seeds there. But, but no one that I've ever known, I've been sober almost 38 years, and no one has ever said to stop crying or not to do the anger, you know. And so the terror, the anger and the, the suppressed grief and, and the suppressed anger are why I, I think we're so afraid of death. I think it's all related. And I think once you just start talking to people who are comfortable with you doing the deep dive into these very, very sometimes frightening subjects, that's how we heal. That's how it becomes um, diluted, how the fear, fear becomes diluted. And you start laughing about it. You start laughing about your fear. And laughter is carbonated holiness. And as soon as you're laughing with somebody... You're suddenly on sacred ground. So um, death, I mean, I, 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 I can't stand the thought of, of Sam or Neil or Jack dying. But I don't, th- I don't think about me dying, I mean, almost ever. And when I do, I think I know I'll be caught on the other side. I, 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 I believe in that the soul is immortal, and I believe in the afterlife, and I believe in heaven, and I just desperately hope there's a dessert table there. Um, I have to bring this up since we're on this topic. I just read this great memoir by Alexandra Fuller, you know, the one who wrote Don't Like, Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight. Oh, I love that woman. Yeah, so her 21 oh, year old yeah. son died oh. and, um, in his sleep from natural causes. But it was, um, she's written this terrific book about it. I mean, of course, gutting and really hard, but so much so much wisdom and it's called Fee that, that's what his nickname was F-I Fee and um, I know you would love it so I just have to oh, yeah. was her last name Fuller? Fuller yeah her name you should know about this book this other book I haven't read Fee but she's South Africa in, right. she's her growing she up our, is she our age? uh huh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah during apartheid she's a child and her parents are just 
hopeless drunks, you know, hopeless white privileged drunks. And she writes memoirs about them. And the one is called, she, the husband and the wife will say to each other, because they have something important to do early in the morning, they'll say, oh, let's not go to the dogs tonight. And it means let's not get falling down drunk where we're barking at the ants and the, you know, it, and, and, but they're that level of alcoholic, which I am. I mean, I, I would, I, I am. But I'm sober today. I well, mean, and she is too. But and she's very, yeah. very funny. And so, just because I know you're always looking for books, that's another one. And she's, had, and she's like, she's like you in that she's um, written a, quite a series of books. And life has unfortunately given her a lot of material for grief memoirs. Yeah. But um, this book, Fee, I, I reviewed it in the Post, so some of you might have seen the review. But um, yeah, I think it's. You know, our generation of memoir writers, women memoir writers, have really confronted a lot of dark things, you know, and um, I love the way that you just keep taking the material and turning it into something and taking the material and turning it into something. It's a real inspiration to, you know, all the rest of us who think... um, how can I write another book? What should my next book be about? And I feel like you don't ever think that. You just, the next book is just, am I right? Is it just there? No. No. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that experience. No. I knew that I was, I just started writing a journal of um, Sam's first year and that I didn't plan to publish it. And then my agent said, um, I was just sending her snippets, you know, paragraphs. And she said, I'm just crying every time you send one. And then I'd wanted to write a book about writing because, oh, see, with operating instructions, this is good for writers to know. Um, when, going back, my first novel, I was very young when my dad got sick, and my dad said, I'm going to write a, 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 my version of, of what I'm going through. You should write your version. I'd had three years of writing, but with no story yet. So I started telling the story of what it was like for a family to have the anvil land on it of losing the one we all loved the most, the center of our life, really, my, was my dad. And... Um, But I did what you do when faced with a new kind of catastrophe. What do you do? You go to the library. Those are our great cathedrals, and the answers are there. And I couldn't find any books about families going through cancer that had any kind of sense of humor about it or were doing talking about real stuff, is that there will be a point where I won't be able to reach my dad on the phone. I mean, that still makes me sad that I can't. And so I wrote the book. And ever since there, and at a writingroom.com, I'm always saying, write what you want to come upon, and then it will exist. Write what you need to come upon. And so then with operating instructions, I was single and totally broke. And I thought, well, I want a real book on being a mom, being a single mother, and, and um, that's not like a pediatrician. And there was nothing. And there was nothing where it said mothers get bored every so often. And it, and it never, like I was having thoughts, and I put this in the book, of bundling the infant up really carefully and leaving him outside just for one night so I could get, a, so I could get some sleep. And none of the other mothers who wrote books had ever said that. So I, I, um, but and, once she said it, man, they started yeah, telling. <laughs> yeah. And I can remember being so wasted and sick of him. He had colic too. And I remember thinking, oh God, uh, writing, oh God, he's raising his, um, grim reptilian head again. And he was about six weeks old, you know, and other mothers weren't referring to their babies as having grim reptilian heads, but the mothers got it. And every mother that read it said, thank you. And so I kept doing that. And with writing, you know what I mean. There weren't books that said, if you get published, you're going to be more mentally ill than you are right now. It's, it's not going to save you. It's not going to make you well. It's going to hurt you. It's going to be great. It's great to get published. It's going to be on the shelves for one week with the other 250,000 hardback book, general interest books that will be published in the same year. And, um, and so I thought, I'll write a book that is like, I'm not filled with inspiration. I'm, I write. I'm a writer. I got one of the golden tickets, like in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know, I got one of the five gold tickets, and I honor that. 
definitely but, do. Yeah. You know, I know that they want us to start the audience Q&A now, and I bet there's people that have questions for you, so I'm going to see if they, people want to talk to you. If not, I will. Okay. There's a person. Do you want my mic? Oh, wait, I'm talking. Never mind. <laughs> I forgot. Okay. Oh, my mic! <laughs> <laughs> well, if I knew, I would never listen. <laughs> hey, Anne, I love hearing you talk about death and everything else. For those of us who don't have a Christian or religious faith, what do you say about what's next? About what is next? Straight to hell. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I honestly think that we're just loved and chosen as is, you know, and we're screwed up. We're all very real. And that means we're things can be kind of messy in our hearts and our minds and our, our, our past. We've all done things we're ashamed of and we wish we hadn't done and we wish they'd been more successful. <laughs> they'd turned out better. And I, my understanding, and I'm a Sunday school teacher and I'm not putting myself down when I'm saying I do not have an interesting or complex theology of, of life. I basically have like like Casper the Friendly Ghost in the guise of a brown-skinned Jew from the Middle East. And I only have that going for me. And I love Mary. I mean, how can you not love Mary, right? I mean, she's so sweet and dear. But I just have this one thing. I just love Jesus. And I decided that I was just going, I was just going to plug my nose and find, and, and jump, get in the water and see what happened. But I don't think that anything I do changes how whatever God is feels about me. And I don't think that there's anything I could do to be separate from her love, you know, and her inclusion. And and I and I believe that everyone, and I mean even Henry Kissinger goes to heaven. I believe yes, I believe that every person is just caught as they cross over. You know, Ram Dass famously said that he thought death was like taking off a pair of tight shoes that had never quite fit right, you know. And that's a little bit what earth has been like for me. It's much, much better as I get older. This is the best I've ever, this is the most I've ever loved life. But um, I think that you will be really surprised. I think that when, that you'll be surrounded in the months and weeks and hours of your death. And I think that you will close your eyes and, and go to sleep. And my understanding is that you will be caught. And, um, and, and um, I have no proof. And I have, I, all I can say is that, well, actually, it's something Neil says. He's, and he said it in better days. He said it in everything he writes. He said, life tilts towards the good. And I don't think that, I, that the, all the beauty that surrounds us, even in these dark, cold, freaking us out times, these ribbons and streams of beauty are haphazard. And, I, and so I, I try to plug into that stream as often as I can. And in that stream, I believe you would kind of float off to whatever awaits us. Let me tell you one quick thing that I love and live by is, um, you know, Bill Wilson founded AA. And in the 30s, he had a friend, a priest friend, who told him, sometimes I think that heaven is just a new pair of glasses. And I really love that because the way I am, I have an alcoholic mind, so that means out of one speaker is that I'm different, I'm better, I'm more special. And then out of the left speakers, just this terrible self-esteem. Every alcoholic woman I know has been there. And um, But when I, I consciously put on that good pair of glasses when I get up, and I, I strive to see the stuff that feels like it just can't be from this side of things, you know? And we call it some, when I, when I work with people um, that, are, that are agnostic or athe- atheists, we use the acronym GUS, um, the great universal spirit. And if you, if, if you stay in your mind, in the pinball machine of your mind and your ego, which is not your amigo, you're going to have a life... <laughs> that is really rattled and uptight and judgy. 
And I'm rattled and uptight and judgy plenty of the time, so I change channels. And you know, the longest distance in the world is from your head to your heart. And I do what I can to get there. And I think that you were going to wake up in your heart in love. And this is not, I know this doesn't sound like a rabbi because I know the afterlife is not a big thing in the Jewish culture, but I heard a woman say to the rabbi, well, everyone I love be there after I've died, be there in heaven after I've died. And he said, everyone that is, you will love everyone who is there is why it will be heaven. And so I can't say much more than that. I know that was, I could write it better, but um, that's a little bit of what I think and know. Yeah, you're good. (laughs) You're good. You're all good. You're all in. Come with me. Let me buy you dinner. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I actually have two questions. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. The first question is, with all of the negative news, how do you process it? How do you integrate it into your writing, if at all? And then the second question is, is what is your favorite moment of 2024 thus far? Oh, those are great questions, yeah, honey. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to sit back. Now. Okay, no. sit back. Um, the first one is that I'm addicted to the bad news. I, I'm addicted. I'm watching NBC, MSNBC a lot, and I, I um, dread Twitter. I dread tweet. And the way I handle it is by, with my faith... And with my activism as a progressive in the world. And I will be on book tour till the end of April. And then all I will do for the rest of the year is work to try to help save democracy. That's all I'm going to do. And um, really, I mean, there's so many ways to help. And it's all, it's fun to help. If you want to have loving feelings, do loving things. That's what I've learned in the last 38 years. Is if you, it's, it's black and white. If you want to have loving and safe feelings, do loving things that help other people be safe. And that means help them figure out where to vote and help them understand what's at stake. That it's the earth and it's women's rights and it's girls' rights. It's the LGBTQ rights. It's the existence of democracy and it's going to be really fun for you if you plug in somewhere to a community and there's a lot about community in this book but if you plug in you're going to love it and the work isn't going to feel like work it's going to, you're going to look forward to it and you're going to even maybe be willing to go door to door and say to people do you have a minute can I leave this here so um, that I, I handle the dread by taking the loving action that helps other people have hope. When I don't know what to do, I go around the neighborhood and I pick up litter. Or I call my most, my, my annoying aunt who didn't even like me till 10 years ago. I go visit her because she's lonely. And I bring hope to her in the guise of chocolate and a bouquet. And then there's hope in my, on my emotional acre because I brought it. So that's the system, is that if you want to feel hope or joy, bring it to someone, and then you can breathe it in yourself. Yeah. And your favorite moment. Oh, my favorite moment in 2024. Oh, my God. I've had a number of them, but um, I'm going to have to answer that in a minute because my mind went blank. I used to write food reviews for California Magazine. So people were mostly in San Francisco or Los Angeles, and people would ask me for the name of a restaurant and I mean, I wouldn't be able to think of a single restaurant I'd ever eaten at in my whole life. Yeah. So um, I've had a lot of really beautiful moments of reconciliation with people that I hadn't been doing very well with, that I had beautiful hugs of forgiveness with. And I, I can't tell you those exact people right now. But, um, but that was his question. Did you have your own question? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. Um, forget so, about him. Yeah, forget, yeah, forget about yeah, him. Yeah, let's yeah. move forward. Move on. Yeah. So lots of times when we pick our friendships, we pick people who we're c- compatible with or people we like or whatever. But when you go to church, you don't get to pick the people. You know, the people who are in church are the people who are in church. Yeah, yeah. So how do you... Um, love all the people or be with all the people who, if you weren't in church, you would never make them your friends? Oh, you know, 
There are just people at church who make my skin crawl. (laughs) You know what? That's the nature of community. We're a vulnerable species. We're as vulnerable as kittens. And we're a violent species. And Cain is still killing Abel. And there's a woman at my church who hates me. And hates me. And she's very... There's only about 20 people at my church. We're a failing church. Um... (laughs) And she has singled me out as the object of her self-hatred. And she has said to people at the church what she thinks of me, right? And so I I haven't been going for a couple of months because I needed to get out of that. I just can't. It's just not safe for my soul to be there. And so I've I've been going to this funny little church in Richmond or 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 I stay at home and Zoom my church. And um, and then on Easter, I thought, I know, I'll go there and I will just be God's love in expression because I believe that's who we are. And I will look at her. Her name is Andrea. <laughs> and, um, and I said, I will, I'm going to go up to Andrea and I'm just going to put my arms around her because we're working on this committee. And I got to church, and I was so happy. I love the church more than really any other place on earth, any other place I've ever been on earth. It's where I, I got saved and found and sober. And, um, and I sat down, and I saw her, and I went, ah, 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 And I turned my chair a little bit, and I sat there like a Ross Chass character going, ah, 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 and, uh, and I got out as fast as I could. So um, you do the best you can. <laughs> You do the best you can, and I try to, I, I mean, I do this with Trump, too. I know my inner Andrea. She, she's like a funhouse mirror for my bossy, judgmental self. I know my inner Trump. I know that bombastic egomaniac. And I wrote a couple of books ago, I wrote about something Martin Luther King said, which is, don't let them get you to hate them. And I was so tied up with my hatred of MAGA and the whole thing that it was making me toxic. And that, you know, in recovery, people always say, the willingness comes from the pain. And when I made myself that crazy, I got some help. And, um, and with this person, I'm getting some help now. I wish if I were God's West Coast representative, I would have a magic wand and I would tap people like me and help them be restored to just loving and, you know, amused by how funny, how silly we can all be. But it's and so it's going a little slower than I would have hoped. (laughs) But I'm I'm doing it. I'm doing the work. I put her name in the God box. And the next time I go there, I will be easier. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I really, uh, your comment about theological understanding of a bright second grader really resonated with me. Wait, I couldn't, wait. I, you I, said earlier you had the theological understanding of a bright second grader. Yeah, yeah. Um, I taught high school for 31 years and last year retired to start a divinity school at Duke. So I just finished my second sem- semester at Duke in seminary wow. um, to be United Methodist clergy. Wow. And I'm speaking on Sunday about forgiveness. Um, in a church in Washington, D.C. So I wanted to ask you your thoughts on forgiveness. And do you feel like you forgive more easily now than you used to? And do you feel like you're a forgiving person or, or something about no, forgiveness I'm not a that forgiving will make person. my sermon yeah. fantastic? Yeah, yeah. No, if you're a Christian you're supposed or a spiritual person, you're supposed to be a forgiving person. I don't buy it. Um, no, I do. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> I um, believe that earth is forgiveness school, and I believe some days are just too long. And I have hurt some people so deeply, and I have tried to do some healing around them by making, trying to make it right over the years, over all these years. And there are a couple people I'm still struggling with, I'll say, that... um, but it's it's so much better when you get old. I'm not kidding. Because you kind because it's this thing, you don't have that kind of time, right? You don't have that kind of time to carry around these little toxic sacks of unforgiveness. And so um there are many things that change for the good as you get older. One of them is you just start throwing stuff out of the airplane of your life that kept you flying too low for too long. 
Okay, and you coming up are the last person. Yeah, come on up. You're good. You're good. Come in. Um, and so I've done amazing work. But, of course, it all begins with the hardest work of all, which is we have to forgive ourselves. And when I first stopped drinking, the women that were helping me were saying, were beginning to talk to me in this way, um, where for the first time in my life I was understanding that the problem began with my own self-hatred and with this really deep shame I had about myself and that no human power could relieve me of that, but that I could, could become available for really, really deep healing and I was going to need to make a list of the people I needed to forgive or who I had hurt in a, in a really deep way and needed to seek forgiveness from. You know, when all else fails, follow instructions. So I did it. But um, it's easier for me in the last 10 years. I loved my 60s. And and, um, I've been 70 for like a couple hours. And and I'm loving my 70s. How could you not? (laughs) But anyway, there's a lot in this book about forgiveness. And there's a whole chapter uh, in some book or other, let me think, in um, Traveling Mercies. There's a whole essay, and I think it might even be called forgiveness. Okay, yes, you. Hi, and I'm Hillary. It's great to meet you. Thank you so much for coming to D.C. It's been a bucket list item for me to ever hear you live, probably like a lot of people here, so it's wonderful to be here. Also, happy birthday. Um, I think of myself as a writer, always have since I was little. I can't, so far, haven't been able to seem to finish a whole book writing a whole book. I've written a lot of little things, but not one big thing. And I struggled to figure out what, wh- which idea to go after. How have you decided, this is the book I'm writing now, and then this is the book I'm writing. What's, what's been your process for Well, I'm always it? just writing one thing at a time. And so um, Neil has um, one great like mantra, which is finish it. Like, whatever you started, even if you've lost confidence in it, finish it. That's what a writing room.com is entirely about, is 500 people telling, finish it. And then you, then you have a draft of something. Even if it sucks, you know, you have a draft and that is a miracle. But I've always kind of, um, I, I, I can only do one thing at a time, one piece at a time. There's some great tips for writing at Neil's website. I'm not kidding. And they might give you a a benevolent kick in the butt. But the website is, um, oh, God, what is it? Um, (laughs) Don't tell me, Neil. Um, Shapesoftruth.com. That's the name of his first book. Shapesoftruth.com. There's 37 rules of syntax and writing. And one of them, and, and just read those. I mean, it's free. Just go there and you can, um, read and, and you just, are you practicing, you know, like we all are as human beings, we're practicing forgiveness, we're practicing radical self-love, we're practicing self-respect. We're pra- so you practice it, but you can get these rules, you can get, you can sit at the feet of the masters, you can read the very, very, very best books you can and figure out how they did what they did, how they got time to ch- pass, you know. You can't say, okay, well, so then about, I think, 11 years later, you can't do that. Or in the 40s, in the old movies, you know, calendar pages would fly out the window or the clock hands would spin around, which I worked perfectly for me, right? I mean, they've never been improved on, but this is the written word. So, you know, the old dog's muzzle goes gray. The, your own muzzle grows gray. You're some, um, you figure out, you study it, you become a writer, you, you fully immerse yourself in the writer's life. That means you read all the old Paris Review, Writers at Work interviews. It's just about craft. How do they do it? And they'll tell you how to finish things. You just you do it by prearrangement with yourself. I'm going to finish this this year. Are you going to? Tell me now. You are? Yes. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> good. Hi. Um, You wrote a beautiful piece recently for the Washington Post, and I'm also a walker, and it really spoke to me on a writer level and a walking level. Um, You said, paradoxically, I see more. Now, instead of sharp focus, there's an appreciation of shifts in light that reveal the mutability of the world. The light sometimes changes minute by minute, 
and with it perceive changes in the energy around us. And it moves our attention outside our squinty, judgy little selves. And I guess my question is, as a writer, how do you get outside your own head? How do you stop focusing on what sounds good and what looks good and get to the root of the story? Uh, That's a good question. Um, The way you get to the root of the story and what wanted to get written and used you because it doesn't have hands. I believe it was inside you all along. But I write stuff and I, and I I just try to sound more erudite than I am. And I try to sound a little funnier so people won't think I'm a buzzkill. And, um, and I end up having to take a lot of it out because it's not authentic. And um, Jessica Mitford famously said, you have to kill your little darlings. And I go through and I have to, t- and Neil will mark them up. And it'll be funny stuff that we would laugh about, but that is sticking out because I kind of shoehorned it in because it was a great line or a great description. But something like that that you might have liked might have taken hours for me to get right because um, you, you bring it forth, but it's like bringing wet, rich, black clay from the river and putting it on your table. You kind of know what it is, but you got to work it. And you move it, and you try it this way, and you try it that way, and it wasn't right, and you keep working it, and its shape emerges. And you just got to not give up. My son Sam has, we never give up, tattooed on his left forearm. You just don't give up until you get it right. But you've got to have a community. You've got to have somebody who will read your stuff for you or a small community. It could, doesn't have to be online. It could be at a community college. And people will say what we used to say in the, um, all the old people here know this phrase that are, we're writers, you put it through the typewriter one more time. And of course you do it on the computer now, but you do that passage, that two paragraph passage one more time, take out a third of it. That's almost always a secret. <laughs> take out a third. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I, I wanted to close with, thank you. Marion and I have a friend that we both love so much. He's one of America's greatest poets. And one thing that we both like to do is um, foist people we love on you. Because I know a lot of you are just passionate readers and you're looking for, for names of who to read. And if you're a writer, you need to read more poetry. That You just have to read more poetry because the poets are, are doing it. And... Um, Naomi Shihab Nye is a, um, you, uh, an Amer- uh, Arab American writer, and she, we were laughing before we came on that if you find a book of her poetry, you'll, you, it'll be a book you can foist on everyone for Christmas. You don't know what to do, and you find a beautiful little book from some small press, and it will fit in your hand in a certain way. And she, more than almost any poet I can think of, will fit in your heart in a certain way. And so, you know, the news is so crazy. You heard that the Golden Bachelor people broke up. (laughs) Did you read that today? Three months later? I mean, he picked the wrong person. First of all, she was not my choice. They've split up. (laughs) But really, when you when you wake up in the morning, the news will be just unfathomably bad. It will be all, it'll either be the devastation of climate that we're wreaking on this country, or it'll be MAGA. It'll be the MAGA madness. It'll be Arizona. It'll be the 1864 law when the age of consent for Arizona girls was 10. 60 years or whatever it was before women had the right to vote. So you're going to see all that. We're getting a lot of that. And to count, to be a counterweight to it, both of us think that there is nothing more effective than a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye. So I'm going to read you one, and I know a lot of you are familiar with this poem, but you can't hear it too often. Right. It's called Gate A4. Wandering around the Albuquerque Airport terminal, after learning my flight had been delayed four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands my Arabic, please come to that gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. 
So I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing, help, a wailing. Help, said the flight agent. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly. Shudoa, Shubikuk, Shabidi, Stani Shwe, Minfadlik, Shubit, Siwi. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, no, we're fine. You'll get there just later. Who's picking you up? Let, let's call him. We called her son. I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane and ride next to her. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons just for the fun of it. Then, <laughs> then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic, and found out, of course, that they had some 10 shared friends. <laughs> then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took, took up two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling of her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. There is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out free apple juice from huge coolers, and two little girls from our flight ran around serving it, and they were covered with powdered sugar too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves. Such an old country tradition. Always carry a plant. Always stay rooted somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary travelers, and I thought, this is the world I want to live in. The shared world. Not a single person in the gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all those other women, too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. Thank you. And thank you, Marion. And thank you all. Thank you.